what I'm going to talk about to begin with are different types of action uh, that, that are part of water rights litigation. And it can take um, a you know, variety of, of shapes and forms. I'm going to run through the types of cases and, and how they originate and kind of how those cases go, you know, both based on, on doing cases like that and also deciding cases relating to water rights. Um, while I was on the, the Pollution Control Hearings Board. And it looks like the format is for me to run through my stuff and then answer questions later. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have, um, even some of the same questions Steve got, because a few of my answers might be a little bit different. Not too different, but maybe a little different. So um, there's a handout that I gave Catherine that I think is going around. I hope there are, there are enough of them. Um, and it just lists out what the kind of primary um, water rights appeals procedures are in, in, in the state of Washington. And, you know, there's, there's no limit to the types of water right appeals there can be. It's only limited by the, the creativity of the members of the bar that practice water law. Uh, but these are kind of the, you know, lion's share of what there are in terms of, of water right appeals. The first category, of course, are appeals of ecology's water right permit decisions and also um, uh, any sort of decision that's an enforcement situation or a metering order, those all go to the Pollution Control Hearings Board. And so you have everything from, in the, in the three or so years that I was there, um, you have new water right decisions, you have transfers or changes of existing water rights, you have orders where an existing water right holder has been ordered to start metering their water right, um, that's an appealable order. There are relinquishment orders where ecology, sometimes at the request of the water right holder, sometimes on its own, will issue an order to the owner of a water right um, that a certain portion of that water right has been relinquished. Uh, there are also enforcement type situations where someone may be using uh, surface water without a permit. Any surface water use requires a, a permit from the department. And as we've discussed previously today, groundwater uses over 5,000 gallons require a permit. And so if there's unauthorized water use, um, ecology can issue enforcement orders against people doing that. And those are also, um, those can be uh, sent to the PCHB. And typically appeals have to occur 30 days after ecology issues one of their, um, their, their orders. Um, and the appeal process before the PCHB um, you know, usually takes about six months. It's basically like a uh, trial. Uh, it's, a, it's more formal than like hearing examiner processes that you may be familiar with um, in, in doing land use matters with local governments in that there's formal discovery and witnesses, typically expert witnesses. There's a full evidentiary presentation to the board, including witnesses and cross-examination and things like that. One thing that's a little different than most um, trial procedures, such as Superior Court, is that the, the three members of the Pollution Control Hearings Board um, get to ask questions. And so usually for each witness, the witness will, will run through their, their presentation from their attorney. There's a cross-examination period. And then, and then each of the board members can ask certain questions. And uh, sometimes the board's, the board's questions, I found myself, reveal how little we know about water law, uh, but it's an important thing, I think, in, in that process for the board to be able to clarify certain key points. Um, once the Pollution Control Hearing Board issues their decision, then the PCHB's decision can be appealed to Superior Court. And so in some of the titles of, of major water rights cases that Steve um, sh uh, showed you previously, the caption or the name of that case is the name of the party versus PCHB. And so even though it's ecology's decision, and ecology issues the permit decision, or ecology issues an, an enforcement order, once that's appealed to the PCHB, the PCHB then issues a decision on the appeal from ecology's decision. From that point forward, it's not an appeal of ecology's decision, it's an appeal of the PCHB's decision. And so that's why you see that caption of PCHB as, as the defendant even though it's originating with, with a decision by, by the Department of Ecology. Um, a second type of, of appeal process are appeals relating to um, minimum in-stream flow rules adopted by Ecology. We got a little bit of this earlier from, from Joe. Um, in essence, a, a, an in-stream flow rule adopted by Ecology is just like any other rule adopted by any state agency. There's a State Administrative Procedures Act and the Administrative Procedures Act has requirements that any agency has to go through when it adopts a rule. And so just like when 
Fish and Wildlife adopts a rule that governs hunting season or Department of Transportation adopts a rule on contracting procedures to build road projects, Ecology's in-stream flow rule is just a regulation adopted by a state agency. It's different in many respects because it affects people's ability to use water rights that are junior to that in-stream flow rule, but it is just a regulation and the process for doing so is governed by the Administrative Procedures Act. There's some you know, influence on what can be in an in-stream flow rule from the water code itself. There are two chapters of law, um, 9054 and 9022, that also govern um, the purpose of ecology adopting the, those in-stream flow rules. But once the rule is, is adopted, any appeal of that rule goes to Superior Court, typically it goes to Thurston County, um, which deals with appeals of agency rules. And once it's adopted, you can raise issues both in terms of procedural aspects of the rule, that is, under the Administrative Procedures Act, there are all sorts of procedural requirements for rulemaking. You can raise issues that ecology did not properly go through those procedures when they did the, the rulemaking process. You can also raise substantive claims, um, such as that, that the rule is inconsistent with, uh, with the Water Code 9054, which kind of describes what the in-stream flow rule does. So that's a typical kind of appeal. You know, there are probably, I don't know, 35 or so in-stream flow rules on the book around the state. Very few of them have been subject to, to superior court cases. Um, the, the Skagit case that was discussed earlier was appealed, but that was settled based on the recent amendment to the rule. Um, a third type relates to appeals that would come out of um, any sort of decision that water is available for a building permit or for a uh, subdivision. And so, again, as described earlier under the Subdivision Act, local governments have to determine that there's water available for a subdivision of land for most types of land subdivisions, and also that there's water available uh, for the issuance of a building permit. Um, that decision by a local government, like numerous other types of land use decisions, is appealable under the Land Use Petition Act, sometimes known as LUPA. And LUPA is a separate chapter of law that basically governs all sorts of different land use appeals. And so typically, LUPA appeals go to the superior court in the county where the land is, is located. And so if, um, the example would be, if a local government determined that water is available through exempt wells or because of a water right or because of a certificate of water availability from one of the water systems or from the PUD that water is available and allowed that subdivision to occur, someone could appeal that on the basis that water is actually not available, either because the water that's available is junior and is not going to be legally available during a certain part of the year, or that the water supply is not a legal water supply if it's an exempt well use over 5,000 gallons, let's say. So all, all sorts of issues on why that water is not a lawful water supply, that would be part of a superior court of case. So, um, for the fourth one is water, water right quiet title actions. and. You know, this kind of arose out of the kind of water disputes in, in the Old West where you had all sorts of disputes between private parties over who owned the water right. And so a, a quiet title action over water is just like a quiet title action over land where you go to Superior Court and figure out who actually owns it. Um, the next one beneath it is kind of a, you know, the monster quiet, um, quiet title action, which is a water right adjudication. And so. A water right adjudication is, in essence, a quiet title action for all water rights w within a certain area. And so typically, in this state, um, water right adjudications have been in state court. And tip, you know, to date, they've mainly been surface water. Um, for example, you've heard about the Yakima, uh, the Aquavella case, which has been an adjudication that's been proceeding since 1977. You know, that's been an extremely complicated water right case because the Yakima Basin is a really complex system. It has numerous sub-basins. Uh, it has federal parties who have water rights by virtue of contracts with the federal government through the Bureau of Reclamation. You have water rights dating back to, you know, the late 1800s. You have newer water rights that have been issued from, from the Department of, of um, from, from the Department, excuse me. Um, and you know the, the thing to keep in mind about about adjudications is in some cases you know people will discuss the Aquavella case as being pending since 1977, and they're like, oh my God, you know how how can a case take that long? Um, you know, keep in mind that, that the Yakima system is extremely complex, numerous subbasins, and it's not it's not a proceeding that occurs every day. You know, currently in the in Yakima Superior Court, there's a monthly water day, so one once per month. 
parties to the adjudication come to court, resolve certain issues, and they're kind of working it through sub-basin by, by sub-basin. Um, if, for example, uh, someone wanted to adjudicate um, the, the, the Quilcene Basin, let's say, uh, which is a much smaller self-contained basin, um, you can petition Department of Ecology to, to commence one of those adjudications in Superior Court. Ecology can ask for it if they choose to do so, um, and it would deal with only the water right holders within that basin. The difference is, you know, the sheer number of water right holders in that basin compared to Yakima, for example, um, you know, it's just a mere fraction. And the other difference would be if in, in a adjudication people sought to really ride the whip on it and get it done, you, you know, you could, you could do that within a period of probably a couple years. Um, and that's something that could be done if the state chose to invest money in that and if that's something that people locally wanted to do. Those adjudications can, can kind of cut both ways because in the adjudication process, you know, you're not going to end up with more water um, than you had to begin with. Typically, you're only going to end up with less. And so for that reason, there's very little incentive in a lot of cases for water users to seek to have a adjudication locally. At the same time, uh, it really makes managing water a lot easier because it provides a, a real strong sense of certainty. You know exactly the quantity of water that people have. You know exactly what their priority date is. Um, and in, in the Yakima Basin, I don't know if Joe talked about this much, but um, one of the projects we worked on was a fairly complicated water right transfer for Suncadia Resort, which is in Roslyn, in the very upper part of the Yakima Basin. And in essence, it was a 6,000 acre resort that had no water associated with that 6,000 acre parcel. And so to provide water, um, Suncadia Resort bought irrigation water rights um, from numerous sources downstream. They were approximately you know, 15 to 25 miles downstream and then transferred the use of the water upstream about 20 miles to be used at, at Suncadia Resort, both for irrigation of the golf courses and for, for, for domestic use at the condos and houses and lodges. And what happened is if you're taking a water right from downstream and moving it upstream 20 miles, that 20 mile intervening reach doesn't, now does not have that water in it because you're taking it out sooner. So what do you have to do? You have to mitigate for that. And what was done was buying water rights throughout that, that dewatered stretch from small tributaries, transferring them to the trust water right program to then make up for the amount of water taken out. And adjudications have tended to get a bad knock because of how long they've taken, but, but the outcome of them uh, can, can be very positive. So um, the last one are um, appeals of, of ecology water resource agreements. And in addition to various permit decisions and in-stream flow rules and, and things of that nature, um, another thing that ecology will get involved in are memorandums of agreement or different types of informal agreements with water users or water purveyors that address all, all sorts of, of, of water right issues. Typically, those can be appealed also under the Administrative Procedures Act. It's considered other agency action. It's kind of a strange creature. It's not. It's not a rule, it's not a permit, it's not a certificate that water is available for use. It's just a recognition that this is an agreement made by the department to do certain things, to not do certain things. Those can also be appealed. It's rare that they are, but, but that type of action exists. Um, and then there's kind of the, the, the other categories of things. As I talked about, you know, there are a lot of creative attorneys out there that can come up with all sorts of great appeals. Um, the case that Steve talked about, which is the constitutional challenge to the municipal water law, is what they call an as-applied challenge in that it's not actually appealing anyone's actual water use, claiming any um, actual damage or harm from the water use. It's an appeal of the statute itself that the, that the statute passed by the legislature is unconstitutional for a variety of reasons. And so in, in some respects, the appeal of that case is, is it, it addresses a water law statute but it's in many respects more a case about constitutional law and the powers of the legislature than it is about water rights. Um, another example that just popped up you know, in the last couple months is from Kittitas County. Um, I know you've talked a bit today about exempt wells and limitations on exempt wells and, and the, the Campbell and Gwynn case. One, one thing that's kind of been kicking around the state is based on the Campbell and Gwynn case that said that 
a single project is limited to 5,000 gallons per day for domestic use um, raises the question, what is a project? And so in Kittitas County, there was a, a developer who filed successive applications for land subdivision under different LLCs. And so on, on the same day or closely related, uh, there was an application for a subdivision from, we'll call it, you know, Acme LLC, and then also with it was Beta LLC and then Delta LLC. And each one created, I think, like 12 or, or, or 14 different lots. Ecology appealed it not on the water rights, uh, but raised an appeal under SEPA, which is the State Environmental Policy Act. And as most of you know, certain land use activities are subject to SEPA. Certain land use activities are exempt from SEPA. Um, this type of subdivision, based on the number of lots, was subject to SEPA, and the, and the county had issued uh, an, an MDNS, which is a Mitigated Determination of Non-Significance. Ecology appealed that um, to, to Kittitas County on the basis that SEPA requires consideration of cumulative impacts. And so in looking at the application for one subdivision related to the next subdivision related to the next subdivision, all of which were being proposed by the same developer for adjacent pieces of land, that those applications are in essence related and in fact one application and the cumulative impacts need to be reviewed. So that, that's a, it's a SEPA appeal at the county level, but it in essence addresses the water right issue that comes out of the Campbell and Gwynn case dealing with, with the extent to which people can use the, the groundwater exemption. Um, a couple issues um, in, in appeals generally that I wanted to discuss. Um, one is the concept of, of agency deference, and that is, you know, administrative law can be quite boring. Uh, but if you deal with it a lot, it's, it's actually quite interesting. And so, you know, when you're on the Pollution Control Hearings Board, one of the issues always is under uh, any agency decision, um, agencies get deference. And under case law, that's been developed through the Administrative Procedures Act that it, it in essence means that if an agency has expertise in a certain issue and they have a basis for their decision, even if there's another theory that could support a different decision, so long as the agency had a basis for what they did, they get deference because of their expertise. One of the ongoing issues that, that was not resolved prior to 2002 was in the context of water right appeals, which agency gets deference? Is it ecology that makes the permit decisions, or is it the Pollution Control Hearings Board, which in essence is just another executive branch agency. It has a judicial function, but it is part of the executive branch which of those two agencies gets deference. And, and that issue was answered in the, in the case that deals with the third runway for the Port of Seattle. And the Supreme Court found, and I, and I think that this is the, the correct result, that it's the Department of Ecology that gets deference uh, and not, not the Pollution Control Hearings Board, uh, especially as it relates to technical and kind of factual matters. And that's because the Pollution Control Hearings Board uh, similar to Superior Court judges or Court of Appeals judges, you know, the members of the board are not scientists. Um, they're typically attorneys, though not always. Ecology is the agency that has the expertise on groundwater and hydro hydrogeology and all the related scientific issues. And so one thing that, you know, I, I think it, it's, it's frankly helpful that, that ecology gets deference for the reason that if you're the applicant for a water right and you work with ecology in the application process, you can help work through certain technical or factual issues such as you know, the extent of hydraulic continuity or does the mitigation plan work. And that can be an iterative process between the water right applicant and the department to really go through all the different technical issues with the help of experts and, and, and anything you need so that ecology has all the information that they need to make the right decision. That kind of interplay and interaction doesn't happen with the Pollution Control Hearings Board or at Superior Court. When you're at that level, you in essence just have the board or the judge making decisions based on the evidence, and there's no ability for those bodies to really interrelate with the application itself. And so for that reason, the concept of agency deference is, is important to remember in that if you're an applicant for a water right, um, if ecology turns you down and you have the right to appeal, you know, that's great, but you're in a much better position uh, to have ecology grant your decision and have to defend it against a, a, a third party that, that might appeal it because ecology is the experts and so they will get deference during that, that appeal process. Um, 
Another issue that, that is important to keep in mind is standing. And people commonly ask about this in terms of, you know, is it true that anybody can appeal anything about anything? And, and the answer is no. You know, standing is, is limited um, to people who can show that they're, actually imp that they're actually impacted by that action. And so, for example, if there's a water right that's issued uh, in, in this area and someone appeals it and they live in Lewis County, um, you could challenge their standing to say, look, you know, you have no actual interest in this area, either economically, environmentally, aesthetically, and so you just can't appeal something that, that, that doesn't affect you. Um, and there have been a number of cases on standing on, on water rights cases. Uh, you know, typically what happens is um, it's not all that difficult to establish standing so long as there's some kind of local connection. And so a lot of times in, in some of the names of the cases that, that Steve went through, you'll see names of, of local community groups um, that have an interest in a certain application. You know, in a lot of cases, what it takes to establish standing is a, a local interest in the environment or the aesthetics or fish or wildlife or something like that. But, but you have to be able to, to demonstrate that. You, you, know, you, you can't just show kind of speculatively that you have some general interest. You have to show some organizational or, or, or personal interest. And you also have to show that, that there's a risk of harm. That is, you can't simply appeal things um, just to make a point, just to try and prove a point in, in water law to establish some principle through case law. If there's no actual harm or impact, um, it can be found that you don't have standing. And so that type of case just, just can't, can't be brought forward. Um, the other thing you see in, in appeals these days are the increasing complexity of uh, water right decisions. And it's the same whether it's the in-stream flow rules that ecology is dealing with right now um, or whether it deals with individual permit decisions. And the question is, how much certainty and how much knowledge does ecology have to have before they can make that decision? And it could be a decision to turn down a water right. It could be a decision to issue a water right. It could be their decision on what type of in-stream flow level to set, how much water is truly a minimum in-stream flow. They're all, there's a host of, of technical issues that, that come up now. Um, and that's a really difficult one to deal with in the appeals process because in a lot of cases, there are ongoing requirements for groundwater monitoring or things like that where ecology has probably enough information to, to make a decision though it's subject to some ongoing requirements to understand more. And so in a lot of cases, um, you know, before ecology will issue a, a decision, there may be a one-year or two-year monitoring process that the applicant has to take on in order to have the information just for ecology to be able to make some sort of decision. And so that's one of the ways I, I heard some groans about the, you know, the, the cost reimbursement process. Um, that's the current reality is you know, water right decisions are increasingly complex, and so the burden really is on the applicant to come forward and show that it can meet the criteria for a water right, whether it's a transfer or a, or a new water right. Um, and in a lot of cases, that means that the applicant has to pay for processing of their own, uh, of, of their own decision. You know, the, the criticism of the cost reimbursement program, and it's in, the, it's in the legislature this year again because the authorization for cost reimbursement agreements um, ends in, in 2007, you know, the, the criticism of it is how it affects sm smaller water users. That is, it can be very costly um, for people to pay for processing of water right decisions. And so um, while larger applicants and more complicated projects can probably afford to do so, smaller applicants frequently cannot. And that's, that's one of the realities um, in, in water rights processing. That's why in the statute, if people are going to use the cost reimbursement process, they also have to pay for the processing of people who are ahead of them in line so that applicants who can or are willing to pay money to be processed can't just jump over others. So um, finally, I want to shift a little bit to the role of, of litigation. Um, and, and just some general comments on it. You know, I think if you look around the state, uh, both in terms of um, projects that go forward and in-stream flow rules, both kind of policy and watershed planning type stuff and actual at the, at the project level, um, if you calculated um, water right litigation uh, in terms of hours, it's a very small part of 
water resource planning and, and, and permitting. Litigation in terms of hours is probably a very small part. Um, in terms of the outcome of cases, they're very big. And, and you know, it's, it's unlike other areas of law where there are, you know, hundreds of insurance claims in the courts today and there are hundreds of divorces in the courts today and, you know, thousands of criminal cases and that kind of stuff. You know, really there are not that many water cases. And, you know, what, what you heard from Steve really is about what's out there in terms of water law cases throughout the entire state. Um, there are very few um, because of the uncertainty associated with water right litigation. A lot of people say that, you know, the time to use litigation is when you've reached a point where you can't solve your own problems. And in a lot of cases, that's true. Um, from, the, from the private side, from the project proponent side, whether it's a, a utility that wants to serve water or a developer who, who needs water, you know, the, the bottom line is not litigating water rights cases for the point of, you know, making a final determination of what hydraulic continuity is or litigating water rights to really get to the bottom of what the, the exempt well statute adopted in 1945 should mean. Because in essence, a lot of, you know, project proponents, they don't have any interest in that because their interest is in doing their project and getting on with life. And so for that reason, you know, you don't see a lot of, of big water right cases coming out each month. There are probably a couple per year. And while on the Pollution Control Hearings Board, there probably were, you know, I'd say 30 or, you know, 30 or 40 water right appeals per year. Um, and probably, you know, five, five of those went to an actual decision. And so if you look at the number of permit decisions made by ecology, which on water rights, numbers in the hundreds per year, uh, of those hundreds of decisions, probably, you know, 10% get appealed. Is that about right, Steve? Something like that. And 10% and get appealed, and probably of the 10% that get appealed, only 10% of those actually get to a decision. And so water right litigation is a very small part of the actual, you know, number of hours spent on all this water resource stuff. But when a decision does come out, it's, it, it's a very important decision because it shapes all of the other permits that, that, that can be issued. Um, and I'll give you one example. There's one question to Steve that um, I'll make a couple comments on. And the question was, um, what's the priority date of an exempt well? And he, if you recall that question, and I think he and Fred discussed it, and the answer they come out, came out with was, it's the date of actual use. And there's a basis for ecology to reach that decision because the water code has a strong preference for actual beneficial use. That is, you know, your vested water right is based on your actual, the actual beneficial use, the amount that you've actually used it. Um, but you could also look at it this way, that there is a concept called the relation back doctrine, meaning that when someone uh, takes an action to appropriate water, their priority date may not be the date they actually use water, it's the date that they first took an affirmative step to develop that, that water right. And so looking at, at Ecology's water law treatise, it says, when the actual diversion of water to a beneficial use on land is at a time later than the work of constructing the means by which it is diverted and is begun, the time of diversion relates back to the beginning of the work only when the work has been pursued with reasonable diligence. So the real question is, was the work in this instance pursued with reasonable diligence? And so, it, you know, it, it, it's an interesting question in terms of um, what is the priority date for exempt wells? Because if someone goes to Jefferson County to get a building permit uh, today and they have all their, you know, their applications ready, they have their design for their house, they have septic approval, they have everything and it's ready to go, and they say, my source of water is going to be an exempt well, and here's the test that shows that I can produce X number of gallons per minute, and everything's ready to go, and here's, you know, septic approval and everything I need. And then they start constructing it in June, and they actually use the water in June of 2008. Uh, is their priority date June of 2008, or is it the day they went to the counter at Jefferson County and express their first interest in using water and then pursued that interest with reasonable diligence over the period of a year until they could actually use it. Um, ecology has a basis for concluding the way that they did in the question, and it's just kind of a, you know, it's a question that is quite interesting, and there's a basis for that. There's also obviously support 
for the way that I would argue it to say that the priority date is the date that you first take the step to start the use of the water, which is getting an actual building permit to use the well. Um, now, is that issue worth litigating? You know, if I'm the homeowner or I'm the attorney for the homeowner and this homeowner uh, has the issue of is there a priority date for their water right June of 2008 or is it January 12th, 2007, um, it may not matter because if there are no senior, if there are no intervening water rights during that period that are senior, that are taking some action that would prevent the person from being able to use water because of the June 2008 priority date, it doesn't matter. And even though it's an arguable point, there's really no point to actually litigate that. If the person can build the house and use the water and people are going to leave them alone and they can get on with life, why bother? You know, if, however, there's an intervening water user that uses all the water available and based on a June 2008 priority date, that person has no water and no house and the investment is completely lost, that's probably worth litigating. Um, that type of case, I would think, would ultimately not go to a decision because it's the kind of thing that you probably should be able to work out. The amount of water that a single house uses is probably something you can figure out without having to resort to, to full-scale litigation over it. So, you know, that's the kind of example that, you know, maybe it'll come up, maybe it won't. Um, we'll, we'll just have to see. Um, the other thing I wanted to shift to um, from talking to Catherine are just, you know, kind of pr private sector strategies um, and, and opportunities. You know, one is it relates to water rate permitting generally, and then part two is it relates to the in-stream flow rules. And, you know, as you've seen over the past, you know, 10 to, 10 to 20 years, um, reliance on new water rights as a source of water for residential development or commercial development is not what it once was. In essence, it's very difficult to get new water rights. Where they are issued, they're in areas where water is in fact available physically because there's less competition for it or you're in water-rich areas, or it's as part of a fairly complicated uh, plan that, that has mitigation involved. Um, Steve referred to a case um, called Miller Land and Timber to give an example of, of mitigation that was required um, to get a, a water rate permit for a residential development. It was in Thurston County, and it was about, I think, about 45 homes. The plan to get water uh, through a new water right involved um, using two different wells. And one well was a well that would be pumped to provide a, a supply of water for the residential development. A second well would be used to pump water from a deeper aquifer up to the surface to then augment stream flows during about five months of the year. And so you had a surface water, it was a small creek that was closed to further appropriation. And it's possible, uh, and, and it's pr I think it's fair to say it was probable that the withdrawal of groundwater for the residential development could impact that stream. And so what the developer did is develop a mitigation plan to pump deeper water up, augment those flows at a certain rate from you know, June through October or so when, when flows were low. Um, that's the type of thing that people are doing now to be able to get water rights. Um, and the issue at the, at the PCHB was, in essence, did they use the right model in determining how much flow had to be pumped for augmentation purposes? That is, you know, do you have to augment it with you know, half a CFS or one CFS and how much actual impact on the surface water is being caused by the withdrawal for the, for the development and thus how much do you have to mitigate for? And so that case, as Steve said, came down to whose model seems to make more sense and also not just which one is right but which one is kind of taking the necessary precautions to deal with the uncertainty. And that's one of the big issues that, that a lot of project proponents face is, you know, the level of information on water rights is not going to be exact. And so because of that, people tend to have to over-mitigate to deal with that level of, of, of lack of knowledge. <laughs>